What's going on wildlife? So as you guys know, I've done a few videos in the past with habanero peppers and they just can't seem to get away from me because I love them so much. The habaneros brought some friends today. I've got some, I think it's pronounced serrano peppers and then some jalapenos. These are a little bigger, but uh, hopefully they're not too bad. So I'm gonna be trying these. I'm gonna be seeing how they taste, um, how much they catch my taste buds on fire. So with that numero uno. This is weak. Ah, I regret this. My eyes. Apparently it's supposed to be a little hotter than jalapenos, but uh, they look like little green bananas. This tastes like spicy chalk. There's too much. Ugh. It's funny because the habanero, best flavor, but it's so spicy. What's up wildlife? My name is Johnny and if we haven't had the chance to meet, I'm the middle school director here at Wildlife and welcome to another week of Wild Life. Before we go into our time of teaching, which we like to call the most important time of the video, before we go into that time, I want to uh, uh, invite you to do a couple things for me. One, go ahead and make sure you download those message note sheets you guys can either get on our website, rockypeak.org, or from an email you guys, uh, that your parents should have gotten earlier this week. Uh, the second thing, uh, sorry, the last thing I want to remind you as well, is that we are currently in life groups. We meet every Wednesday night on the Worship Center patio from 6.30 to 8 o'clock. And if you want to come to life group and you haven't registered already, go ahead and go to rockypeak.org and go to the middle school section. You guys can go ahead and register there. And now I, I want to say real quickly, if you've already registered for life group, you don't have to register again. It just helps us get a better estimate any, of any new people coming to uh, coming to wildlife. So again, if you're brand new and you want to come to life group, we would love to have you. Life group is a mix of uh, grade and gender, which we like to call Grender, which is uh, pretty much just, you know, we have seventh grade guys, eighth grade girls, stuff like that. And each life group has uh, two leaders, one to two leaders of the same gender. So we would love to have you. But anyway, let's go ahead and jump on in to this message. But before we go into that, let's go ahead and pray. So Father, we just come before you right now, Jesus, and ask that you would just speak to us, that you would just show us more of who you are through your word as we're about to dive in to your Bible. I just ask that you would just speak to us. You would show more. You would reveal more of yourself. And I just pray that we would really learn how to ask people to come to church, how we can ask people to come and learn more about you. And Lord, it's, if we're honest, it can be really scary, but we know that you are with us. You, you know, uh, we know that you are for us. So we just ask you would just show us more of how to love people like you have shown us love. We give this time to you and love you so much in your name. Amen. Now, Wildlife. If you and I were to get to know each other a little bit, I know some of you already know, you know, you know, I love The Office, you know, I love Disney and superheroes and technology and PlayStation and Xbox, give or take. Um, but there's some things you may not know about me. And uh, this is more some some of my uh, personal life. For example, I grew up in a Christian home. Both of my parents are believers and I grew up going to church and I didn't come to Rocky Peak until I was in fourth grade. And I was just like you. I grew up going uh, through RPK. Uh, at the time, it was called Cliffside. Uh, but I was going through RPK. Then I went through Wildlife, which is really where I learned that church can be fun and really exciting as well. But honestly, I didn't meet Jesus until I was in high school, till I was in 10th grade. I always knew who Jesus was, but I didn't really have a relationship with him until about 10th grade in high school. I can't tell you an exact time, but I remember in 10th grade, that was really where uh, I just learned more about Jesus and I really knew that he was for me and not against me. But I remember specifically uh, back in wildlife, there is a friend of mine at my middle school that didn't believe in Jesus, uh, didn't believe uh, really maybe in any religion or anything like that. But we are really good friends. We really got along really well. We would play basketball together because if you guys don't know, I was I played basketball and it was okay. Um, I wasn't good, so don't try to like one up me or anything. But anyway. Uh, we played basketball together and we were really good friends and I remember talking to him about church and wildlife at the time and how we would do all these crazy games and all this stuff and I remember he always felt kind of 
like kind of weirded out by it. And I remember I kept asking him and asking him like, hey, do you want to come to church? Do you want to come to wildlife? And he had all these like assumptions of what church is. Maybe church is really judgy. Uh, it's not for me. If I go there, they're just, they're just going to like hate on me and tell me I can't do all the fun things that I want to do and all just like this crazy stuff. And I'm sure some of you have heard that as well. Maybe you have a friend that just has these like assumptions of what church is, is that church is really judgmental and it's just, just terrible. And there's like really weird, like stained glass windows and like old men with long white beards that look like Gandalf and, and Dumbledore mixed together. And they're telling you that you can't do these things and if you, you know, if you don't do these certain rules, then you're going to go to hell and you're going to die and all this stuff, right? And a lot of people have these assumptions of what church is. But as we know, as you being in wildlife, you know that church is, wildlife is church. We are church for 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students. And wildlife exists to unleash a movement of passionate Christ followers that are 6th, 7th, and 8th grade students, right? That's what wildlife is. And we have fun and there's like crazy games with like, fish and like pudding and, 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 you know, and, you know, socks full of flour that you like get hit by a leader and all this crazy stuff, right? If you guys don't know what I'm talking about, it's called ghosts. It's a lot of fun. Any sixth graders, you'll get there one day. But I remember all this crazy stuff that my friend was telling me when I was asking him to come to church. He was like, no, no, I don't want to go. And maybe you've been in that same boat as well. You maybe ask someone to come to church or ask someone to come to wildlife. And they're like, no, that's not for me. Last week, we kind of learned more of how we can be a community of unity in wildlife. And I left you guys with this question that we talked about this past Wednesday at Life Group. And the question was, do you know your role? You know, do you know that you, you have a role, you have a part to play within the body of Jesus? You have a part to play within wildlife. And I gave you pretty much an example of what your role is, is that you are a student in wildlife. Your role right now in the church is to be a student in wildlife. But you might be wondering, how, what does that look like? How do, how, do, how do I, what does that look like, right? But what it means to be a student in wildlife is that your call, your role is to tell other people about Jesus. And I'm not making that up. I'm not just saying like, that's your role. That's actually from the Bible. That's my role as well, is to tell other people about Jesus. That's Trent's role. That's Rachel's role. That's Kelsey's role. That's everyone's role in wildlife. Whether you're a staff member or a student, your role is to tell other people about Jesus. Now in the Bible, there's a fancy phrase called making disciples. And a disciple is pretty much just someone that follows someone else, that they do everything that, uh, the, uh, that they follow, uh, whoever they follow, they just imitate them. And as, as uh, followers of Jesus, we are to be disciples of him, that we do what he does as well. And this comes from Matthew chapter 28, starting at verse 18. It says this, Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is pretty clear that our call is to tell other people about Jesus, is that we are to go throughout all the nations and to make disciples. Now, let's kind of put that in the context of middle school, right? Your role, your job is to tell other people about Jesus and make disciples in your schools. To, you know, to tell uh, and make disciples of all schools, all nations, right? All schools. And in wildlife, we want other people to know how good Jesus is and that he's for us and not against, uh, not against us. And we just started Life Group this past week, uh, a couple weeks ago, we just started Life Group back up. And Life Group is a great opportunity for us, for you guys, to be inviting people that may normally would never come to church. And that's just a great opportunity. And right now, we are going to learn what it means to make disciples in the context of Life Group. And we're going to learn more of how there's a simple, easy way how we can invite other people to wildlife, to Life Group. And you might be a little nervous, it might be a little scary, but our call as Christians, as followers of Jesus, is to go and make disciples of all schools, all nations, right? So if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open up to Luke chapter 19, and we're going to be starting at verse 1. And as you guys turn there, I want to give you a little bit of background, a little bit of, a, a, of a context, so to speak, of what this is talking about. The author of this book is known as Luke. So if your name is Luke, good job, you have the same name. Um, but the author of this wrote this book, uh, The Gospel According to Luke, and then he also wrote another book known as 
acts. Now, Luke is uh, part one, so to speak. Think of it maybe like a TV show. We have uh, season one and then season two. And in season uh, one or part one, Luke wrote this book, which is telling the gospel of Jesus, the good news of Jesus. So this is part one and then part two is in Acts. So if you ever read those two books back to back, they like pick up right where the other one left off. So it's really cool. But we're going to be in Luke chapter 19, starting at verse one. And what we're going to do, we're going to read this one th uh, all the way through just one time, and then we're going to read reread it and kind of stop and kind of, I'm going to help you understand more of what Jesus is telling us through this time. All right, so let's go ahead. Luke chapter 19, starting at verse 1, it says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus, and he was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short. He could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore tree uh, to see him since Jesus was coming that way. Verse five, when Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All people saw this and began to mutter, he must have gone to be a guest with a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is the son of Abraham. For the son of man came to seek and save the lost. Now, there was a lot we just unpacked there. Uh, that's a lot we just read. But now let's kind of take a moment and let's unpack it by rereading it one more time and focusing in on a couple of verses. So let's reread it. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man there named uh, Zacchaeus was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. Now, what you need to know about tax collectors, I've shared this before, if, it's, if you've been in wildlife for a while, I've shared this, is that a tax collector was a Jewish person that also worked for the Roman government. So any other Jewish people saw that a tax collector was, uh, was near them, they immediately were like, oh man, this person's terrible. This person is awful. And they really hated tax collectors because tax collectors would tax Jewish people. They would take their money, but also, oh, they would take their money to give to Rome, but also they would take a little bit more to kind of keep for themselves as well. So they were really uh, crooked and just evil people from other Jewish people's eyes. So let's keep on reading. Oh, and also a chief tax collector was pretty much like a tax collector's like boss. He was like really wealthy, really rich. He wanted to see who Jesus was because he was short. He could not see over the crowd. So we can see that he is a really short guy. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw, him, saw this and began to mutter, he has gone to be the guest of a sinner. So let's unpack that real quick. So we can see that Jesus was out and his name was getting really popular. Everyone is know, knowing about Jesus. And Zacchaeus has heard about Jesus and he's really curious as well about who this Jesus guy is. And he wants to see him. He wants to see Jesus with his own eyes and maybe hear more of what Jesus is teaching other, uh, what he's teaching other people. So he climbs a fig tree because he's a short guy. And what you need to know about a fig tree is that they had really low branches. So it's pretty easy to climb them. And he, in doing so, he was trying to see Jesus. But you have to understand that this fig tree was probably pretty still a good distance away because he, knowing himself, was probably like, I'm not good enough to be next to Jesus, next to this guy that claims to be uh, of, uh, of, of God, right? So what we need to understand here is that Jesus immediately sees Zacchaeus and he's like, hey, come down immediately. I must stay in your house today. And then what we can see in verse six is that uh, Zacchaeus immediately came down and said, okay, I'm gonna welcome you into my house. But then we can see everyone else around them were like, man, Jesus is hanging out with a sinner. That's, that's not a good thing. Now, reading all this, we can see that there's a lot going on in here. And now based off of this passage of the Bible, how are we supposed to invite others to wildlife based off of this uh, passage of what God is showing us, right? And let's be honest real quick, uh, quickly. It can be really scary and really intimidating to invite other people to wildlife. Because if you're like me, it can be really scary and just, 
What if they say no? What if they don't want to be friends with me anymore because they found out I'm a Christian, that I love Jesus? All these things start running through your mind. But really, what's the point of this passage? How can this relate to inviting other people to church? Now, there are three truths I want to unpack with you guys from this passage. The first one being, it's going to be on your note sheet. The first one being, Jesus doesn't wait and neither should we. Jesus doesn't wait and neither should we. We can see in verse 5, it says, When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So we can see Jesus immediately saw Zacchaeus, probably from afar because he was in a tree, right? We can see that he said, hey, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay in your house today. And what we can see is that when we're inviting other people to wildlife, when we're inviting other people to church, we shouldn't wait and hesitate like, ah, oh, should I invite them? Should I not invite them? We should immediately just say, hey, come to wildlife. We would love to have you. And we can see that Jesus didn't wait and we shouldn't wait either. Now, the second truth is this. Zacchaeus was ready. Zacchaeus was ready. It says in verse 6, he, so he came down at once. So immediately he came down and welcomed, welcomed him gladly. So immediately Zacchaeus was like, okay, Jesus, I'm going to invite you into my house. So we can see Zacchaeus was ready. Jesus was, made the invitation, made the invite. And Z Zacchaeus was like, yeah, absolutely. Let's do it. But let's see this third truth that is maybe a little bit different than uh, the last two. Some people, is the third one, some people are not ready. Some people aren't ready. We can see in verse 7, it says, All the people surrounding this, all the people saw this and began to mutter, He has gone to be a guest of a sinner. So we can see that all these people see that Jesus, being righteous and holy, invited a sinner, maybe the worst of the worst, into his own, into, uh, invited, um, sorry, uh, asked Zacchaeus to invite Jesus into Zacchaeus' house. So we can see all these people are like, how can that be? And the third truth again is that some people aren't ready. And we can see here is that all these people probably thought that Zacchaeus was awful, just bottom of the bottom of the barrel. And they probably put themselves on a pedestal on a stool and being like, hey, I'm way better than this guy. Why is Jesus hanging out with this sinner? So we can see that some people aren't ready. Some people aren't ready maybe to come to church. But let's unpack this a little bit more. Here's a key thing for when we start inviting people to wildlife, and I'll give you a challenge of how to do that in an easy way. But what we need to understand is that when we invite people to wildlife, here's the key thing to remember. Uh, it starts with us. Inviting people to church, to wildlife, it starts with us, right? As we can see, Jesus immediately went to Z Zacchaeus and says, hey, I want to hang out with you. I want to spend quality time with you. And we can see that Zacchaeus just needed someone to invite him, someone to ask him to hang out. And here's the thing. Here's the challenge I want you guys to take away with this time is that we need to start making the ask. So the challenge is you need to make the ask. And what I mean by that is that when you go to someone at school, maybe it's in person or over Zoom, or over FaceTime, Xbox, PlayStation, whatever, right? When you're hanging out with a friend that normally doesn't go to church, invite them, ask them, hey, do you want to come to Wildlife, my church group, with me? And we're going to talk about um, our lives, and we're going to play some really crazy games and all this stuff, and we're just going to hang out and have a good time. The challenge is to make the ask. And kind of going back to the story we started this time with is that when I was in middle school and I invited my friend to church time and time and time again, I kept asking him. He kept saying, no, I don't want to do that. I know what Christians are like. No, I don't want to do that. They're terrible people. But after a while, I started to ask him more and more. I probably got really annoying about it, but I started to ask him more and more. And eventually he said, fine, I'll come with you. And he did. And he had a really great time. And he didn't think it would be like what he thought it would be because he realized, wow, church is so welcoming. All these people that love Jesus, they're so welcoming and, 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 and inviting. And here's the thing, there's a lot of people in our lives right now, whether it's at school or, on, or wherever, a lot of people right now are searching for answers because we're living in a crazy time. So, so many people are searching for answers and they're probably just waiting like Zacchaeus for someone to ask them to come to church. Because here's the thing too, so many students and other people are maybe dealing with depression and they don't know what that's like because they've never been depressed before. And so many people are looking for answers or looking for hope. 
And here's, so be- uh, here's the beautiful thing about when you invite someone to church is that you are inviting them to something bigger. You are inviting them to something much better that anything else can offer them. You are inviting them to come into the presence of Jesus, into the presence of a community that loves Jesus, that cares about others. You are making a big ask. But you might be wondering, what if they say no? What if they say, no, that's, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard. You know what? I don't want to be your friend anymore. What if they just, all these crazy things happen? If that happens, wildlife, I want to encourage you real quickly. If they say no or make fun of you, you did nothing wrong. Okay? You did nothing wrong. Jesus sees what you've done and he's proud of you. Even if they said no, he is proud of you. I'm proud of you. All the leaders in wildlife are proud of you because you did all that you were asked to do. You made the ask. And that's really powerful. And you never know. If you keep asking someone to church to wildlife, you never know. They might say yes because they might want to see uh, what Jesus is all about. And in wildlife, that's what we're all about. We're crazy about Jesus. So here's the question I have for you. As you're thinking through, maybe you have someone in your mind that like, ooh, I want to ask them about Jesus and invite them to wildlife. Here's the question. Who is your one life? Who is the one person in your life that needs to know about Jesus, that you want to invite to wildlife? Who is it? Is it a friend in a, in a class? Is it maybe a cousin, a neighbor? Who is it? Who is the one person in your life that you need, that you want to ask to come to church? Here's the one thing I want you guys to remember. Jesus didn't wait to talk to Zacchaeus, and we shouldn't wait to invite others to church. So, who is your one life? 